Okay, so it's time to do another worst to best, but I'm gonna change it up a little bit. I'm looking at this through more of a scientific lens. I'm also covering one of my all-time favorite artists. This was the first musical artist that I obsessed over. One of his records was my first tape cassette that I ever got, my first actual musical item. Uh, I got it for Christmas one year with a tape deck, like a, a Sony Walkman, and I just played that so often that even my dad knew all the words to it. I figured this would be a really good time to kind of dive into his musical collection and talk about some of the highs and lows. Now, I want to do this a little bit differently than some of my past worst to bests, where I basically just give you my own thoughts, my own opinions, and this is where I would rank them. I wanted to do this a little bit more scientifically, so what I've done is I've taken all of his albums and given them a score out of 10 based on a number of different facets, a number of different variables. Uh, because most of Weird Al's albums, in fact, all of Weird Al's albums can be split into two. They're either straight up parodies, where it's a parody of a uh, existing work, or it's in a style of or an homage to another band. And actually, I kind of like some of those homages and in the styles of more than I like some of his straight up parodies because it flexes his creativity a little bit more. And I, I, I like listening to in the style of's a lot more thinking this could be what one of those songs would sound like. So we've broken it up across the originality of the parody how funny the parody is, and then I've taken a score away for how lame or unfunny or just how uncreative a parody would be. So we've got three facets on that sense of the variable of the parodies. Then for the original tracks, we've got the originality of the new song, how funny the new song is, and I've taken points away for how unoriginal it is, how lame it is, that type of thing. Then I've given each album an overall rating, not rating them from like 1 to 14, but rather giving them a rating out of 10. Then I've totaled all those scores and that's where the ranking falls. So what I'm going to do is instead of telling you each score, I'm actually going to put them somewhere around the bottom here uh, just for a quick reference. I'm also going to leave in the comments the entire spreadsheet of how each of these have broken down. So if you want a spoiler alert and find out which one's where, that's all found in the description as well as on top of each of these albums. So enough of me yammering on, let's just dive into the records. So coming at number 14, it's number 14. I'm up, up the Polka Party released in 1986. So this was one of the first, not necessarily bombs, but this came off the heels of three really, really stellar albums. And I think the main weakness of this album is that, at least talking about the parodies first, is you didn't have that standout driving force of a parody that we had on the last couple of albums. Here, the only one you really have is Living in America, which parodied is uh, Living with a Hernia. And that's fine, but it didn't really quite make itself in the public domain zeitgeist as much as the other two big tracks did. The other big spoofs on this one are pretty lame as well. We have Addicted to Spuds, Here's Johnny, and Toothless People being the real parodies on here. And it's interesting because Toothless People being a parody of Mick Jagger's Ruthless People, that song bombed hard and Weird Al didn't want to back away from what he already agreed that he'd do, so it was a little bit of a downer on that sense. Uh, Addicted to Spuds being a parody of Addicted to Love, and that was kind of lame, so it actually got quite a bit of points knocked off of this because of the lameness, and Living with a Hernia is okay, but it's, it's more of a crass humor, and I find Weird Al works better in more of a dark humor than he does in a crass humor. So that's why I figured, yeah, Living with a Hernia is not the greatest. Here's Johnny is probably the best of all the uh, the parodies. Um, but yeah, uh, where this album does shine, though, because there are elements of this album that I do really, really love. I love some of the original songs on here. So that's why I got a little bit of a bump on the originality of the songs and how, I mean, they're not all that funny. Like my favorite song off this album is actually Dog Eat Dog uh, in the style of and an homage to like the Talking Heads. But it's not that funny. Like the only real funny part is, oh, I'm working at an office and here are some of the things that happen at an office. One of these days and don't wear those, those shoes and good enough for now are just bland. Uh, I feel like he's done and will do better 
songs in these styles later. Like, especially Good Enough For Now, he's had a lot of those ironic love songs where it's not really about love, like it's kind of taking a dump on it, so... And I feel like Good Enough For Now is kind of the lower end of that. Don't Wear Those, sh those Shoes are just... I, I don't like that song at all. Um, and then the big single off of this album is Christmas At Ground Zero. I think it's one of the only songs that gets repeated listens to on compilation albums. So yeah, that's kind of where that is. And uh, that's why, unfortunately, Polka Party is the last album on this. So yeah, let's move on to the next one then. Number 13. Riding in a bus down the boulevard and the pace will free the pact. Weird Al, released in 1983. The starting point, the first album, the self-titled debut album. And it's interesting, like when I ranked all these albums and put all the albums actually in the spreadsheet, there were a few surprises. And this one is a big surprise for me because I come back to this album more often than I do a lot of other albums that he's got. But I think the reason why is that the originality of the parodies aren't all that original and they're pretty lame. So the duel of how like unoriginal they are and how lame they are drag this album down but how funny they were did end up saving it and that's probably why it's not the last one so talking about the parodies there's not a whole lot of actual parodies and this is one of the few albums i think it's the only album where the entire thing he's done in the accordion so we've got ricky which is a um a parody of mickey i love rocky road being a parody of i love rock and roll um, stop dragging my car around being stop dragging my heart around another one rides the bus being another one bites the dust this is why i'm saying like the the parodies themselves are pretty lame and unoriginal and i'm not all that surprised because it is his first album but a lot of these songs are actually really hilarious like i still even as lame as stop dragging my car around is it's still really really funny oh i also forgot about my bologna which is a uh parody of my corona now some of the more funny moments are actually on the original tracks and this is a Again, where the album starts to shine. Got a Boogie is probably the funniest one, even though it is a little bit of a crass, but the thing that I love about this particular track is the wordplay that we have. Like, Got a Boogie being more of that disco beat, but it's more like I've got like snot on my finger and I'm trying to shake it off. Happy Birthday being hilarious. The funniest track off this album is Mr. Frump in the Iron Lung, and that's why I'm saying his dark humor is where he shines. Damn, I love that track. It's hysterical if you haven't listened to it lately. Um, darkest of dark humor, just FYI. So yeah, it's it's a very interesting album and a very original album in that sense. And uh, I can understand how this like launched his career as a, uh, a master of comedy in music scenes. Uh, so yeah, let's move on to the next one then. Number 12. Off the Deep End, released in 1992. So this one's an interesting album because this one kind of springboarded him back onto the public eye when he covered Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit. His cover here is uh, Smells Like Nirvana and it's not his best work. Uh, I think the thing that I love about it the most, like the big joke is basically like, hey, this is the grunge movement and hey, we can't understand what Kurt Cobain is singing half the time. And that's really the joke. And I know Kurt Cobain loved it and like he felt like he actually made it when he uh, found out that Weird Al was parodying him. So in that case, that's, that's a major win. But a lot of these other parodies off of this album are not great. Like Can't Watch This being MC Hammer's Can't Touch This, uh, The White Stuff being The Right Stuff, um, Taco Grande is the other one that I particularly love off of this, which is just Rico Suave. And okay, so growing up, um, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but growing up, I listened to Weird Al, as I mentioned, religiously. So in my mind, all the songs that Weird Al did were original works. I didn't even realize that half of these were parodies. So it wasn't until like maybe I was a grown adult that I searched out the originals of a lot of these tracks. Taco Grande is one of those tracks where I didn't even realize that Rico Suave was an actual song just for how ridiculous it was. And then finally, uh, the plumbing song, I think that was either Millie Vanilli or Vanilla Ice or something around those lines, but it was like Blame It On The Rain and um, something else. Like there were two songs that were mashed together. So yeah, outside of Smells Like Teen Spirit um, or Smells Like Nirvana and Taco Grande, 
the rest of the parodies just don't quite hold all that ground and it might just be the musical scene at the time as well because the early 90s weren't necessarily all that great and the other thing about this album is some of the original works are kind of hit and miss like trigger happy being in the 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 styles of like the beach boys of you know we're just going to talk about guns and how ridiculous the guns are in america at the time and still are as well as i was only kidding being again it's another one of those love ironic songs this one i kind of like a little bit more than um you're good enough for now because it's a little bit more fun it's a little bit more pump up the jam in that sense when i was your age airline amy those two tracks again i feel like the second half original songs just don't quite bang as hard uh, but i particularly love you don't love me anymore uh again it's it's a beautiful um lamenting track like i think this is one of his few lamenting ironically tracks that duality between the original pieces and the um parodies come together just to create a fine album but nothing all that exciting to write home about so yeah uh let's move on to the next one then number 11 the fat, 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 really, really fat. even worse released in 1988 Okay, so I have a little bit of a confession to make about this particular album. I never put together the fact that the title of Even Worse was a play on words joke about the Michael Jackson album of Bad. Even Worse kind of falls into the same category that Off the Deep End had, but where this album kind of, at least in my mind, elevated itself a little bit more is some of those standout parodies. Uh, we have Fat, which is a parody of Bad uh, leading off this. Uh, I also love... I Think I'm a Clone Now, which is a parody of Tiffany's uh, I Think I'm Alone Now. And again, growing up, I didn't know that song even existed. So I only thought that I Think I'm a Clone Now was an original piece. The one parody that gets me gut bursting laughing every single time is Lasagna, which is a parody of La Bamba. And then we also have, uh, I believe it's George Harrison's uh, I've Got My, My, My Eye On You. Um, and it's been parodied in this song is just six words long which is hysterical because the parody has more words in it than George Harrison's track does. Um, and that's the whole point of the song. It's like there's very, very few words in I've Got My Mind Set On You. And I think that's even more funny on an intellectual level, less so than on a like a, a gut level, like a, like a, an emotional level in that sense. Like lasagna is hysterical on an emotional level. Uh, the song is just six words long, is much more funny on a on an intellectual level and then from there like the rest of these songs are just kind of not great i think the thing about this that does lower it and why it's so low on this list as well are some of the original pieces like stuck in the closet with venna white is kind of it's funny uh because it's just recounting all these really strange and weird dreams you make me and melanie and velvet elvis the good old days they're all just kind of throwaway songs i i just don't enjoy them all that much um and the other parody of alimony just doesn't work for me uh it's not all that funny and yeah yeah so that's why like even worse is where it is the songs that hit hit hard but those that don't do not so that's kind of where it is in terms of the ranking number 10 when I'm for you, for you. never settle for Mandatory Fun released in 2014. The last album, and this was another one that really surprised me of where it landed in the overall structure because I wouldn't necessarily put this where it is if I were just to rank my favorite albums. So that's why I kind of like doing it this way. I like to see where albums lie when I crunch all the numbers. The thing about this one that kind of just, it was a plateau album. There wasn't any one track that really stood out. It's a very like one for all and all for one kind of an album. Uh, and some of the parodies, this also just kind of goes to the musical landscape of 2014. Like I wasn't a big fan of a lot of the music, popular music that was coming out at the time. Handy being a parody of Fancy, Foil being a parody of Royals, uh, Word Crimes being a parody of Blurred Lines, Inactive being a parody of Radioactive, and Tacky being a parody of Happy. Very one word that's just been changed around and that's the joke kind of thing. Like the only one that I really, really like is foil for just how ridiculous it goes. Like 
right off the deep end in the second half of the track. As much as I like word crimes, I guess because growing up with dyslexia and always being made fun of for the fact that I can't spell kind of left a bad taste in my mouth for this track, which is very similar to Blurred Lines itself. Like listening to the Blurred Lines leaves a very bad taste in your mouth. So I feel like the two kind of go hand in hand in that sense for very different reasons. I also feel like inactive uh, for Radioactive, I feel like there's so much more potential to this song that you could really suss out and get some really good comedy gold. And I feel like Weird Al went for the easy route out in that sense. Now, some of the original pieces on here are, again, kind of hit and miss. Lame Claim to Fame, uh, My Own Eyes, First World Problems. These are kind of bland if I'm being perfectly honest. They're not all that funny. They're not all that great. I do love Mission Statement in the same vein that Dog Eat Dog was, where it's like, here's the song just about the most mundane thing you can think of, which is a mission statement in the style of Crosby, Steele, Nash & Young. I thought that was really brilliant uh, because Crosby, Steele, Nash & Young were very much anti-establishment, very hippie, very like do it your own way kind of thing. And Mission Statement is much like corporate to the corporate extreme thing. So I thought that was very, very clever, very smart and very funny. And I also love Jacksonville, Jackson Park Express, the final track off of this. One of Weird Al's best works to date, hands down. It's hysterical, it's heart-wrenching, it's funny on an emotional and intellectual level. Again, this whole conversation that's going between these two individuals without speaking a single word that's basically right in this guy's head is just brilliant. Like we've all been there and having this like wordless conversation with a stranger that's not actually happening. It's very interesting to see where this album fell within the actual schematics. Cause again, I'd probably put it a little bit higher, especially considering some of the albums that we're going to be talking about in a second. So yeah, uh, speaking of which, let's just continue on. Number nine. UHF original soundtrack released in 1989. This one is an interesting one. It's probably the most interesting one because it is a kind of soundtrack to the movie. So it's incorporating some of the parodies that he released in the movie, some of the skits that were actually in the movie itself as well, like Spatula World, like Gandhi 2. And you do have some of the original parodies that were found in the, the movie itself, like Mighty For Nothing being a parody of Beverly Hillbillies. But you also have some parodies that weren't on it, like Spam being R.E.M. Stand, She Drives Like Crazy being a parody of She Drives Me Crazy. Um, and so that's kind of why I rated it where it is because some of these parodies aren't all that original, right? Like she drives like crazy is not all that original. And the joke of that is women can't drive. And like, let's be honest, that's an outdated joke by this point. Like some of the smaller ones, like let me be your hog fun zone, um, attack of the radioactive hamsters from a planet near Mars. They're fun. They're funny. I enjoy that. And then I also love the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota hysterical, just hysterical. Singer songwriter story aspect, like Alice's restaurant kind of an idea in that sense. Um, I thought that was really funny and clever. UHF is a very interesting one in that case. And that's kind of where it is and why it's where it is. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that middle of the road album. So yeah, let's move on to the next one. Number eight. Straight Outta Linwood, released in 2006. So this was kind of Weird Al's gangster rap album. I mean, it, the title is a parody of Straight Outta Compton, uh, Straight Outta Linwood. Uh, I mean, Weird Al is probably the most whitest of white individuals ever. I mean, he's totally that mayonnaise on Wonder Bread. And this kind of style of joking is just like, hey, here's this whiter than white male singing all these gangster rap parodies. Like we've got uh, White and Nerdy, which is still one of his best parodies of all time, uh, parody of Raiden. And I, I think that's a, really about it. Like we do have Trapped in the drive through from uh, R. Kelly, uh, which is Trapped in the Closet. And I'm gonna get to that in a second, as well as Confessions Part 3, uh, which is a parody of Confessions Part 2 from Usher. And I, like the thing that kind of brought this, and again, I was surprised of how low this album was because I do really, really enjoy this album, is the lame factor and unfunny factor of some of these parodies. Like Canadian Idiot, which is a parody of American Idiot from Green Day, is probably his worst. I just don't, 
I just don't. Like, even as a Canadian, I love parodies of Canadian. Like, Blame Canada from South Park is hysterical. Um, but Canadian Idiot is just like, I don't know. I thought it was very easy humor. And Do I Creep You Out being a parody of Do I Make You Proud from Taylor Hicks. Again, it's just fine. It's not all that hysterical. Um, now, I do want to talk a little bit about Trapped in the Drive-Thru, uh, which is a parody of Trapped uh, in the Closet. Putting aside the fact that this track is just a joke, but it is high, high humor. Again, he's doing that intellectual humor of taking a very mundane thing and making this out to be some grand epic. It's essentially about a couple that go for dinner to get some drive through and the way that this song is structured with the highs and lows it's comic genius is what it is like this is and i don't use this ironically this is high art this is very very high art especially when you're comparing it to the very heavy source material of trapped in the closet so the parody of it a it's tasteful B, it's hysterical. Anyway, the rest of the songs on here, like the original songs, uh, Close But No Cigar, uh, Don't Download The Song, Weasel Stompin' Day, Virus Alert, All Suya, and Pancreas, they're fine. But again, I think that this has the same kind of problem that Mandatory Fun had and that no one of these tracks kind of rise to the top. I do enjoy Virus Alert being a unique originals because I do feel like this is his own style as opposed to being an homage to anybody else. And I, I do actually really, really love Virus Alert, uh, the harmonizations and the interplay and the orchestration of the overall song. But I'll also you being a uh, kind of in the style of Rage Against the Machine, being very hard hitting, uh, Pancreas being another Beach Boys homage, uh, Weasel Stompin' Day, Close But No Cigar. Again, it's those second half original tracks that are just kind of there. Uh, and don't download, don't, don't download the song being another one of those. Um, I think he'll do this again. Kind of like feed the world, we're in this together. Anyway, that's straight out of Lidwood. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> Number seven. Eat it, eat it. Weird Al in 3D, released in 1984. The sophomore album. This was the one that improved upon those things that needed to be improved on and definitely embraced all those things that did work. Uh, the accordion isn't found on all the tracks on here, which I think is actually a bonus because those parodies sound exactly like the originals. Uh, and this was the one with Eat It being Michael Jackson's Beat It. Uh, we've got Brady Bunch, which is the safety dance, which I thought was hysterical. And then my favorite is probably Theme from Rocky 8, aka the Ki the Ryer the Kaiser, which is essentially just Eye of the Tiger, the theme from Rocky 3. Um, ah, just again, high comedy. Love it intellectually, love it emotionally. And I think that's why this album got a really boost. Um, and what actually gave it the boost the most was the original tracks. Midnight Star, Mr. Pro Pale, and uh, That Boy Could Dance, and Nature Trail to Hell. We're going to get to that in a second. These tracks are bumping, they're funny, they're original, uh, and they don't necessarily need to be in a style of anything. Like Midnight Star and uh, Mr. Pro Pale. Like Mr. Pro Pale, I think, is a homage to the B-52s. Um, and Buy Me a Condo uh, is a homage more to like Bob Marley. Yeah, I love Midnight Star. It's a bumping track and it's more in his style as opposed to anybody else's. So it's much more of an actual original piece. And Nature Trail to Hell. I just, I love Nature Trail to Hell. It's dark. It's his dark humor uh, at his best. Yeah, that's all I really have to say about In 3D. Um, overall, a very strong album. There's not a whole lot to subdue it. Uh, I think the only one that I'm not a big fan of is King of Suede, and that's more because I'm not a big fan of the original track. Uh, I like the spin that he did on that. And I Lost on Jeopardy is kind of in the same vein in that. So yeah, let's move on to the next one. Number six. <laughs> Dare to be Stupid, released in 1985. All right, the album that follows up, Weird Al in 3D. Um, this, again, was the one that really kickstarted his career even more. We've got Like a Surgeon being Madonna's uh, Like a Virgin. I Want a New Duck being Huey Lewis's and the News I Want a New Drug. Girls Just Want to Have Lunch, again, is kind of in the same vein of She Drives Like Crazy. Not a big fan of this now. It's a parody of Girls Just Want to Have Fun, and I feel like they 
I think he could have done a little bit more with this track than what he did. So those parodies in and of themselves are fantastic and I really, really love them. But what I really love is the original ones. Dare to be Stupid, again, being a massive throwdown to that new wave 80s that was really going on and really hard. Um, One More Minute is hysterical and basically like, you know, I don't want to spend any more time with this person. Uh, Slime Creatures from Outer Space, original original track but then we have uh this is the life and um cable tv which I'm not a big fan of like cable tv's big joke is something that he's done better which is basically like these are all the shows that i can now watch and isn't tv funny and that's about it now i think the other big staple is yoda which is a parody of lola as a star wars geek i can't help but love this track um and again it solidified my love for weird al when i was a kid so yeah and that was one of the few tracks that i actually knew the original of so i'm like oh yeah this sounds like uh, lola so anyway i think that this is one of his best works and this was one that i was surprised was so low but it just does kind of take into consideration that you know the numbers don't necessarily lie in that sense so yeah let's move on to the next one Number five. I'm watching TV, they told me, they told me, but I'm still doing it every show. My kid- Poodle Hat, released in 2003. So I kind of feel bad about this album because this album was right off the heels of three spectacular albums. Each of those albums had that staple track to really help promote and advertise this album. And the one for this one was the couch potato which was the parody of lose yourself by eminem and i think last minute eminem botched the promotional work he's like you can still have it on your album i just don't want to see a a music video i don't want to see all these different things so the only thing that they really had last minute to pitch this off was a uh, a music video for bob a bob dylan parody uh all about uh those words that are the same front and backwards and like sentences that do that same kind of thing there's a specific name that's uh escaping me right now which is a shame because this album has a lot of really really good original works not the best when it comes to actual parodies parodies of like trash day which is hot in here by nelly it's it's fine uh complicated song being a parody of complicated from avril lavigne was it's pretty funny this also kind of rolls right into why does this always happen to me uh so that's kind of funny uh ebay being a parody of i want it that way from the backstreet boys i feel like out of all this tracks that they could have done for the backstreet boys this was an odd one like this was obviously the one that was very popular at the time but i do also feel like weird owl missed the boat for doing like backstreet boys or in sync or any of those boy bands from like the late 90s early 2000s and it's interesting that this is the one that he chose to finally put pen to paper where this album does shine is the one parody of ode to a superhero a parody of piano man from billy joel i am a huge nerd if you haven't already figured out and so spider-man is my favorite superhero of all time and this was basically just a joke off of the sam raimi original spider-man film this is one that's not only intellectual and emotional, but also fan servicey as well, which is blending three things that Weird Al does really, really well. Much like um, Weird Al in 3D, where this album actually shines is on the original works, like Hardware Store. Again, straight up original, not an homage to anybody else but himself. One of my all-time favorite tracks from Weird Al. Um, Party at the Leper Colony and Wanna Be Your Lover are his. Hysterical. They are top comedy for Weird Al. Wordplay, gross humor, uh, they're all just fantastic. Like cringe on both accounts. And then finally, Genius in France is in the style of and homage to uh, Frank Zappa. So that in and of itself elevates it to just a brilliant work of music. And I think they actually got Dweezil on there to do the opening guitar riff, which is just mwah, mwah. Like, not only is it a great Weird Al song, it's a great song overall. Um, And if you haven't listened to it and you're a big Frank Zappa fan, you really need to do it and listen to it. Because, like, if you close your eyes, you would have figured that this was an original composition from Frank himself. Uh, And I think that Frank Zappa would be very, very pleased with how that song turned out. So, yeah. Uh, Okay, let's move on to the next one, then. Number four. Jurassic Park is frightening in the dark. All the dinosaurs are run. Alapalooza, released in 1993. 
All right, we're coming into this side of the top five. All right, we're getting into the classics, the must-haves. Alapalooza is still one that I love, and it blends those um, really fun original songs with hysterical parodies. Jurassic Park being very timely, right off the heels of Jurassic Park the movie. Um, it's a parody of MacArthur's Park, what, the 60s or 70s song? Um, just hysterical. Uh, now, in terms of, like, actual, like, it's a great parody, but it's not all that funny-ish, you know? Like, the actual jokes that are found on here are, eh, they're all right. Uh, Bedrock Anthem being a parody of um, two Red Hot Chili Peppers songs. Uh, it starts off with, um, I think, Angels of Los Angeles and goes into uh, Give It Away Now. Um, and the whole thing is like, yabba dabba yabba dabba dabba do now, as opposed to Give It Away, Give It Away, Give It Away Now. Uh, Achy Breaky Song is a parody of um, Achy Breaky Heart. I don't like that one, <laughs> mainly because I don't like the original. Living in the fridge being living on the edge. High, high, high comedy. Then we finally end with Bohemian Polka being homage and a parody of Bohemian Rhapsody from Queen because I believe Freddie Mercury had passed away very recently to the album's release. So this was like Weird Al giving back to Queen. Where this album really shines for me is actually within the originals. Young, Dumb and Ugly as well as She Never Told Me She Was a Mime. They're not great. I'm not a big fan of those, but I do love Frank's 2000 inch TV, uh, Traffic Jam, Talk Soup. These three tracks I think are brilliant, brilliant songs. Like not just like comedy songs, but just brilliant tracks. Like Frank's 2000 inch TV is a song that I'll just put on and listen to because I love the song itself. Traffic Jam being funny and again, Poking comedy at a very mundane thing of just being in a traffic jam. And I also just love how Talk Soup is in the style of uh, later Peter Gabriel stuff like So and Us. Yeah, this is an album that I come back to uh, and I think it gets overlooked quite often as being like those staples, but it's got some really great gems on it. So yeah, that's about it for Alapalooza. Let's move on to number three. Place where they can fight me, baby, I perform this way. I'm Alpocalypse released in 2011. Now again, I was extremely surprised to see how high up on the rating scale this album was. Um, but I think the reason why I love it so much is just how solid from start to finish this one is. Like it's number three. According to the numbers, I love this album, and I do. It starts off with another reinvention of Weird Al with Perform This Way being a parody of Lady Gaga's uh, Born This Way. And the music video of this is just Again, it's, oh, it's practically high art. TMZ being a parody of You Belong With Me by Taylor Swift. I'm saddened that Weird Al hasn't continued to do more Taylor Swift parodies because I feel like this one isn't all that great. And then you also have Party in the CIA, which is Party in the USA by Miley Cyrus. It's, again, it's just a tweaking of like one or two words. So the actual lame factor does come up with that one. Another top two being Nothing But You. Yeah, I didn't like the original. This one's fine as well. Uh, and the same with whatever you like. CNR being one for the White Stripes is just brilliant. I love the actual track itself. Skipper Dan being more of like a Weezer track and it's probably my favorite Weezer track. Uh, Craigslist is more in the Doors fashion, which is in itself kind of funny. Ringtone being much more of like Queen. I, I do really, really appreciate that one. And then we have uh, If This Isn't Love. Again, it's one of his ironic love tracks and I think this is probably like this one and good enough for now are kind of at the bottom of the barrel in terms of that kind of stuff and then stop forwarding this crap to me is very similar to don't download this song like I feel like these two are very self rip off but where this album really shines is just how solid those tracks are I could listen to this album from start to finish and just enjoy the entire runtime and always get something out of it I'm laughing I'm enjoying just the different styles of it. So that's what I got to say about Alpocalypse. Coming down to the final two. So once you find out what number two is, you automatically know what number one is. So let's just dive into number two. Number two. We singing my, my, the fear and a good guy. Running with Scissors, released in 1999. I have very, very fond memories of when this came out and this album did not disappoint. The saga begins, I, so little bit about me. I actually really, really enjoy the prequel saga of Star Wars. Uh, I really, really enjoyed The uh, Phantom Menace when it came out. And so the fact that this song really emulates and brings that to life uh, in the lyrical style of American Pie, 
just great, 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 great. A lot of these parodies were of songs that I knew at the time, so I actually got to experience the parodies, how they were meant to be parodied, instead of just, oh, this is another original song from him. So Pretty Fly for Rabbi being uh, Pretty Fly for a White Guy from The Offspring. Uh, Jerry Springer being a parody of One Week from The Bare Naked Ladies. It's All About the Pentiums being a parody of All About the Benjamins from Puff Daddy. Uh, and then uh, Grapefruit Diet being Zoot Suit Riot by uh, the Cherry Pop and Daddies. I love each of these. Like all these parodies are top notch. None of the parodies are half assed. I also love some of the original works on here. I mean, I used to watch the Weird Al show religiously when I was a kid. Like I watched every single episode as many times as I could. So the Weird Al theme show, I knew the words before it even came out. Um, My Baby's in Love with Eddie Vedder is cute. Horoscope for today is really, really fun. And again, that's in Weird Al's original style. Truck driving song is, ah, it's just hilarious. I And instead of like, taking the easy way out and like making fun of cross dressers or anything like that it's like very much punching up of like humanizing them and that i think is how you need to handle this type of comedy like there are a few movies that do this really really well um where it's taking either like a marginalized group or a group that's usually being shat upon and elevates them into a and it's it's odd that i have to say it elevates them into a human status but i mean when society at large demonizes them to a point where it's disgusting to see something that elevates them into a human status of like hey this can be just normal and even though that's kind of the joke that's what i particularly love about it because it's being how absurd it is it that just these people existing is hilarious to people uh and so that's why i really love truck driving song it really shines the light on gender roles in particular, which I, I always love. Now, I also love, and this was one that I wanted to leave off until the end, I love Germs being in the style of Nine Inch Nails. This is my favorite Nine Inch Nails song, and I don't care what anybody says about Closer and all that. Germs is my all-time favorite Nine Inch Nails song. But I'm talking, to, I, I missed out on the best track off this entire album, Albuquerque. I don't know if Weird Al knew the power of this track when he wrote it. 11 minutes and 22 seconds of just off the walls, balls to walls, insanity. I still know every single word of this track and it it really helped solidify my love for progressive rock because any song that was more than 10 minutes, I immediately latched onto because this was one of the first that was a song that was over 10 minutes that just kept going. And I was just like, I love it. I love it so much. I love the fact that it's not stopping and it's really challenging the idea of what is music. Running With Scissors still holds a really, really personal part in my heart. It came out at just the right time. All right, let's move on to number one. Here we go. We already know what it is. Let's talk about number one. Most our lives living in an Bad Hair Day released in 1996. Yep, the highest of high praises for this album. This was the one that started it all. It was the first tape I ever received outside of the Sailor Moon soundtrack. This was the one that just sparked the deep, deep love that I have for Weird Al. Again, I still know pretty much all the words to every single track off of this album. Uh, this one has probably his most popular track of Amish Paradise, a parody of Gangsta's Paradise from Coolio. And, you know, there's a little bit of that backstory between where one said that it was fine and it really wasn't and Coolio did not like it at all. This was also the album where I didn't realize that half of these songs were parodies, right? So like Cavity Search, a parody of Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me from U2, I thought was like a, a an actual song. Same with Gump being a parody of Lump from the Presidents of the United States. Syndicate Inc. Uh, being a parody of Misery from Soul uh, Asylum. And finally, Phony Calls being a parody of Waterfalls from TLC. I didn't know that any of these were parodies. I thought they were original tracks, but I still love every single one of these. Some really interesting tracks off of this as well. Um, the full um, acapella of Since You've Been Gone is still one of the funniest tracks that Weird Al has ever done. Got Colin and Sick, So Sick of You. Uh, they're probably the lower parts of the album, but I still really, really appreciate and love both of them. Uh, I Remember Larry is a great, great track, and I still have really fond memories of like dancing around to this track uh everything you know is wrong is my favorite weird owl song of all time it is his original 
piece. Again, it's that original Weird Al property, not homaging anybody, it's his own thing. And then of course it ends with the night that Santa went crazy. As a kid, this was just exactly what I needed because I was kind of on that edge of believing in Santa Claus, but not believing in Santa Claus. Like it was kind of wavering a little bit back and forth. And so when I heard this, it was just hysterical and I thought it was just the best thing that I had heard. Uh, and so Bad Hair Day, again, the kickstart for it all was the thing that made me really fall in love with it. It still holds up to this day um, in all ways, shapes, and forms. And uh, yeah, the parodies are original. They're funny. They're never lame. They don't like reach for the easy laugh. They actually try to elevate it into something a little bit better. Yeah, so overall, that's Bad Hair Day. And that is the list from worst to best of all of Weird Al's albums. Wow, this was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but here we are. Um, what did you guys think? What was your favorite Weird Al album? Don't worry about doing any kind of math equations like I did. Just let me know if your favorite uh, by commenting down below. What's your favorite parody from him? Yeah, that's that's all I got. That's all I got about Weird Al. I might revisit and talk about some of his individual albums, maybe a little bit later on, but that's where I'm standing right now for Weird Al. Um, still my favorite artist and um, yeah. Yeah, I've been listening to a lot of Weird Al lately because I need some good times in my life. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's about it. That's about it. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, you guys are definitely the best. And until next time, notes out.